This is the Listening Books Podcast. For every kind of reader, and especially for fans of audiobooks. I'm Jessica Stone, and today I've got a conversation with Jonathan Whitelaw, author of the popular cozy crime novel, The Bingo Hall Detectives. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining me this very early morning on your side of things. I believe it's 3.30 in the morning where you are, or just past. It is indeed, yes. It's uh, it's still dark. It's very cold. But I yeah. am delighted to be here, delighted to have been asked to come on the show. And, and that's, that's getting me through the, the wee small hours, believe me. Well, I appreciate you joining us from all the way over in Canada. Um, the Bingo Hall Detectives has been enormously popular with Listening Books members, so much so that it was shortlisted for our Members' Choice Award this year. So I imagine quite a few listeners will already be familiar with the story, but for those who aren't yet, would you mind grounding us uh, with a little synopsis first? Certainly. And uh, I am delighted that it's that it's proven so popular. I was absolutely over the moon when I when I was uh, informed that I was on the I was on the the, the list uh, of the finalists and lost out to the to the simply wonderful Ben Aranovich. Um, you don't really lose out to Ben Aranovich, do you? That's the that's the, the great <laughs> part about it. He he's such a wonderful talent, and uh, it, it's uh, yeah. I was I was delighted. I'm a massive fan of his, by the way, uh, and really? I've had the the, the 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 wonderful opportunity to interview him a couple of times as a journalist with my journalist hat on, and he is uh, a raconteur of the very very highest standards. So it's it's yes, I was delighted delighted for him, and absolutely over the moon just to even be considered. Um, amongst those wonderful writers. So thank you very much to all the listeners. Uh, yes, sorry, synopsis. Um, so The Big Hole Detectives, it takes place in Cumbria, in the Lake District, uh, in and around Penrith, and it follows the uh, adventures or misadventures of a mother-in-law and son-in-law detective duo, amateur detective duo, Jason and Amita, as they uh, try to hunt down the killer of a, um, a pensioner who's a member of the local bingo club. And um, the pair of them don't get on, as is unfortunately sometimes the case between mothers-in-law and sons-in-law. Jason's an out-of-work journalist. Amita is a 70-year-old uh, pillar of the local community. And she suspects that the death of her bingo hall colleague isn't as accidental as the police first they first think. And they set about trying to catch the, catch the killer. So it's, uh, it's cosy crime. Um, set in the heart of the Lake District, and uh, and yeah, and that's that that that's it. It's 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 always I always find it really really hard. I always find it really interesting, as well. When when you know, as an author, you try to sum up your own your own work because it always just lives in your head, free of charge, and it's you, you always you're you're always the one that has to explain it. So it's it's uh, it's it's, it's, <laughs> it's often it's often the biggest challenge that you face as a writer is is summing it up in 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 no uncertain terms. I, you know, I can believe that, um, and yet I, I just sort of assume that's the, um, that's the bit that you've got memorised after so many interviews and book events. <laughs> that's it just it, would exactly. Roll off the tongue. <laughs> maybe I'm just bad at it. In fact, that probably is it. Maybe, maybe I just don't put the extra work in, and and and, and I and I try to leave it to improv every single time. I like to live dangerously, Jess. There you go. That's the that's the answer. <laughs> Well, you know what I like about your method is that it sounds fresh, you know? It doesn't sound rehearsed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very, very kind. <laughs> um, the book is still very popular, by the way, with Listening Books members. And I know that because when I tried to borrow the book to prepare for this uh, conversation that we're having now, there was a wait list. So um, <laughs> I had Excellent. to go elsewhere to get Excellent. I think um, one of the reasons it's so popular is not just because of the wonderful writing, but also because you have a really good narrator reading the audiobook. Um, Sid Sagar is his name. And I'll, I'll admit here as you know the host of a podcast about audiobooks that because my day job is in audio um, and so I'm listening all day. Um, when it comes to my downtime and my personal reading, I don't usually choose to listen to audiobooks. I usually choose to read because my ears need a break. Of course. Um, but I think with this particular book, I think I'd still listen to the audiobook because the performance of um, all of these wonderful characters that you've created 
um, with all their different voices and accents. It is a really great performance. So my question to you is, what was that process like in selecting the narrator and and how much involvement did you get to have in that? Certainly. Um, I completely agree with you. I think Sid did an absolutely outstanding job. In terms of... Um, in terms of my sort of contribution to it, the, the Harper North, my publisher, are an imprint of Harper Collins. They've got their own, you know, uh, audio division and things. And my editor, uh, she said, "We've got this. We've got this uh, actor in mind. But would you mind listening to a uh, sort of demo uh, of of what of, of what he what he's got to what he's got what he's going to bring to the roles, what he's going to bring to the to the book?" And I said, "Absolutely, I was." I was delighted. I was, you know, I, I I don't have any, don't have any history, don't have any expertise in in this sort of thing. So I was just delighted to be asked, let alone, uh, let alone, you know, hearing demos and things like that. So what happened was Sid uh, got in touch with me, uh, and he said he had a couple of questions just in terms of like, you know, what he had in mind and and what I maybe had in mind for the characters before he put any any vocals to it. And then he did a, a he did a demo, a completely you know rough cut, uncut, unedited demo, and he sent it across. I think it was about three minutes long, maybe maybe just under three minutes long, and he couldn't have picked a harder scene to do as a demo, right? Oh, which scene was it? Well, this is this is it, right? It's a it's I think it's maybe about I think it's from from about three quarters of the way through the book, and it involves Jason Amata. And uh, the cantankerous D.I. Albi, the local police officer who's uh, a, a detective who, who's in He's uh, one of my favourites. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, he's one of my favourites too. He's, uh, he's quite, a, quite a character. I'm uh, <laughs> yeah, very proud of him. And also completely loathe him at the, at the same time. But I guess that's, I've, I've done something right there if you get that emotional response. Anyway, you've got those three very, very distinctive voices. Plus there was a little bit of narration in the, uh, in, in the, in the section that he sent across. And honestly, Jess... My jaw hit the floor because, like I said, this wasn't edited. It was all done, you know, as far as I could tell, in in, in one take, and it was outstanding, absolutely wow. outstanding. And I emailed him straight back and I said, "You've nailed it, completely off the, off the cuff." Because that was the thing. Like I said, I'd never ever had any sort of experience in this in this say uh, in this sort of field, and to be honest. When I was writing the characters, I couldn't really hear their voices in mm. in, in in the sense that you know to, to to know what their accents were like or to know the sort of pace at which they speak. As a writer, or certainly for me anyway, um, you you kind of know what you think they sound like as words on a page. If that if that makes any sort of sense, yeah. I know a lot. Of, I know a lot of authors who. Will um, who who know exactly what their what their characters sound like, they look like, and all the rest of it. And I, I strangely, I'm not like that. But I know, I know when I've written something a bit of dialogue, for example, if that's right or it's not right because it because of what it looks like and the and the rhythm and things like that. And to hear Sid do such a wonderful job bringing these characters to life, I must admit, I did pinch myself a couple of times and thought, did I actually write this? Aww. You know, it had that sort of out, out, out of body experience, and I, I, it's purely down to purely down to Sid's performance. He is he. I, I genuinely can't can't uh, can't thank him enough. Um, I I think from the audio producer side of things, I can also say that narrators really really thrive when they're given writing that's really good and that and that makes their job easier. You know, I mean, it's. I have I have been in both situations. I've been in situations where the the, the actor it is struck is sort of fighting against the writing because yeah. it's a bit it, it's not really written with the way you might read it aloud course, in mind. Of course, and I've seen how actors just sort of bloom when they're given writing that is. Uh, really fun to read, and and I I don't say easy to I don't want to say easy to read, but that has a good flow that helps uh, that helps with that natural delivery. So yeah, big fan of Sid Segar. Now we'll look out for more of his uh, narration. It was a big, big. It was a big thing for me actually, um, and for for my first experience having that sort of contribution, I couldn't have asked for a for a better experience because I think you're right. I think. I think the narrator makes such a massive difference to the to the book. 
um, when it comes to an audio version, you know, I, I'm, I'm acutely aware that I'm preaching to the choir to to, to you guys' audience, um, and it, it wasn't something that I was worried about. I wasn't concerned about, but I have subsequently become that way because I think I got so lucky with Sid, um, and it really, really did feel like lightning in a bottle. But when when I heard his performance and 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 the and the my words, as it turns out, <laughs> as it turns out that he was that he was reading in the characters. Yeah, it was it was a really really good experience, and 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 I can't praise Mr. Cigar enough. Yeah, um, you said that you don't really hear the characters' voices per se, not you you know at the level of their accent and I suppose actual vocal quality that sort of thing when you're writing. Yeah. Um, do you ever? Do you ever find yourself thinking about the audiobook or how it reads aloud when you're writing, or is that something new since you've had the audiobook? I think I've always been quite a. Um, it feels like I'm I, I'm a sort of visual writer, which I suppose in 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 the same sense it translates to audio as well because I write a lot of dialogue. You know, my my books are are, are filled with a lot of dialogue, mostly because I really really enjoy doing it and. I, I really enjoy having a conversation between characters that feels like it's not all come from my head because it has, uh, but it's actually just like you're sitting down and you're listening to a conversation between old friends or, or people that you know or indeed you don't know and, and it's going on and you're eavesdropping. Um, and I think that's what I always sort of strive for with with my books, with my characters in particular. And particularly Jason and Amita, I think uh, because they're so different people, different generations, you know, different abilities, different attitudes towards life, different attitudes towards each other. There was always that conflict. There's always that rubbing each other up the wrong way. Um, and to do that, a lot of it is through the dialogue between the two of them and mm. the, the, the the huge sections of dialogue between those those characters in the book, in the books now, um, are an absolute joy to do because I thoroughly, you know, I thoroughly enjoy spending so much time with these characters. And I think... The, the joy for me is 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 hearing in, in you know in, in quote marks hearing their voice, but actually seeing it on the page for me. And w- what I what I have noticed is so I I, I took a I, I took a little while off between um, finishing the edits for the Bingo Hall Detectives and starting what would become the vi- the Village Hall Vendetta. And um, when I when I write dialogue now, I hear Sid's interpretation of the uh, of their accents and things. And actually, I do find myself. There's been the odd time when I thought that doesn't sound that doesn't sound the way that Amita would say something like that. So I'll go back and maybe have that little tinker with it. And I guess that's a good thing, right? That 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 means that as as we've you know, if I haven't praised uh, Sid enough. <laughs> to this point, then I guess we've, we've reached that we've reached that saturation point where you know he's affecting the the, the, the dialogue. But it's it, 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 it's it's been a really really it's been a really liberating experience actually being able to hear being able to hear these characters brought to life because it's it, it it's added a new depth. That actually, I thought maybe arrogantly, I don't know. I, I thought that I perhaps didn't need when it, when it came to me crafting the actual you know doing the actual work, doing the actual writing. Um, but I'm so glad. I'm so glad it, it has it has happened. And and as I said, as I've said numerous times already, that's that's down to the performance on the on the audio version of it. So yeah, I'm I'm uh, chuffed to bits. Yeah. It's a shame that we're on, we're doing a podcast because my my, my my I've got this big stupid grin on my face and, I, I, <laughs> and it's three thirty in the morning, three fifty five in the morning, and I don't normally smile this much at three fifty five in the morning. Believe me, um, but it's true. It is. It is true. It, it's it, it does. It always brings a smile to my face thinking about the audio version. Ah, oh, well, I love I love that his performance is now influencing the actual writing of the dialogue. That's wonderful. Um, we were speaking of uh, Ben Aronovich earlier and I had done an interview with uh Cobna Holbrook Smith who narrates his um his books of course and I remember I think I remember him saying that that, that it got to the point like they you know it, because he's narrated so many books for him now yeah, yeah, yeah. that there would be little like you know Ben would actually be writing little challenges for him to do and sort of cackle like give him <laughs> give him this this really <laughs> difficult accent to perform you know oh um, fantastic so, fantastic yeah. <laughs> that's what you've got look to look forward to <laughs> That's it. That that's brilliant. I didn't know that. That's 
<laughs> that's fantastic. That's uh, I, I like that. I like the sound of that. That's given me plenty of ideas now for the next one. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, you've got a great cast of characters in uh, Bingo Hall Detectives. That's part of what makes it a great audiobook as well, because it gives that narrator so much to work with, with all those voices. Um, but you've got lots of variety and personality that you've put in there. Um, I said earlier that Albie's one of my favourites. I, I really got a kick out of him early on. Um, did any of these characters prove a little trickier to write than you expected? Well, firstly, thank you. That's very, very kind words about the about the cast. Um, I think with the with cozy crime in particular, the cast tends to be key, um, and because of cozy compared to things like police procedurals and things like that, you know, there tends to be a greater emphasis on on character and 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 dare I say it, that sort of quirkiness and things. And you've got a little bit more room for for wiggle room for humour. Um, the the interesting thing is Jason and Amita obviously as the as the the lead characters they came completely completely fully formed um, more so than any any other time that I've that I've written a uh, characters and it meant that that gave me that gave me a little bit more room when it came to the sort of secondary and tertiary casts um, I think uh, I I think with within the sort of context of characters that, that that maybe took a little bit more work Albie's one of them actually because I think you know, he's not as a character. He's he's coming up for retirement. He's days away from retirement. He has this sort of pathological hatred of of Jason <laughs> uh, for no real reason you know, other other than that. You know, he's he's retiring in a couple of years, uh, a couple of uh, a couple of weeks, a couple of days even, and uh, and he's been lumbered with this really really what he perceives as a bad case of of the the old uh, journalism offices being uh, ransacked, and um, I think. The temptation is always there with a character like that to make him a bit one-dimensional. You know, he's the angry cop. He's the he's the angry way in for our amateur detectives to have a connection to the police uh, if they need it. Uh, if 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 the if the need so comes. So what I wanted to do, I think, with him was maybe give him a little bit more life, give him a little bit more background. So we see we see parts of his family uh, with within the context of the novel, which of course he's delighted at. Uh, I say with tongue firmly in cheek that that Jason is 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 interacting with with members of his own family, and um, and yeah, I, I think that the challenge for me there was to make sure that he wasn't he wasn't just that loudmouth, angry policeman from from a hundred years ago with outdated attitudes and things like that. Which of course he is, you know. Don't <laughs> don't, don't, don't get me wrong, he, he is like that. But I think that the challenge for a writer and challenge for me with him in particular was to was to make sure that it wasn't just that. That's the surface, but actually there's a little bit more going on there and it just adds a little bit more um a little bit more depth to the to the world. And that's that's what you want. It's what I want as a reader, you know, and, and, a, and a listener. You know, you want that. You don't want to come across. You want you don't want to get three quarters of the way through the book and think, right, okay, that's just the angry cop. That's just the you know the, the local busybody. You want there to be a little bit more life to these characters because it's more fun. It's more fun for yeah. everyone involved. Yeah. Now I imagine that because you've worked as a journalist, that you you're probably you're used to the idea of of handing your work over to an editor's hands yeah. and judgment. And of course, you've published other books as, as well. So you again, this is this is not new to you. So I I sort of imagine. Is that is that easy? Is that an, an easy part of the process for you, just to to hand it over and let them make what cuts they want? I think so. I think so. And I, and I think you're right. I think coming from a journalism background, it's just part and parcel of the of the job. Um, you grow a thick skin. You also learn that it's not personal. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's it's not it's not being characters aren't being removed or dialogues being changed because you are necessarily a rubbish at it but you know I, I like every other author that I know and, and probably the world over suffer greatly from imposter syndrome and yeah. um, it, it, it never ever leaves you really it, 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 it never ever goes away no matter how many books that you've had published and how many times you go down that process and like I said I've got, I'm very very lucky to have a wonderful editorial team at, at Harper North uh, who 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 get it? You know they 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 are as much immersed in this world and they know the nuances of the characters as much as I do, and that makes such a massive massive difference. If for nothing else, just a confidence thing. The, the, there's there's a confidence there that that you get when you have a wonderful editorial team behind you because you know that the edits that they are suggesting or they're making are only going to make it better. Um, mm. And I think I I I. I 
I knew that. I found that with the Bingo Hall detectives, and it's only been bolstered with the Village Hall data because I think with as you know with the edit with the editing process of the Village Hall data. I felt so much more confident going into that because I knew what to expect and I knew that um I knew that it was all going to be okay in the end. I, mm. and that is a that that's a that's a wonderful gift for for any author to, to or indeed any anybody anybody in any walk of life, any anybody in any profession, um, to have that sort of support, to know that you've got that support there at the at the sort of key stage. So Absolutely. it's always good fun. It's 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 always good fun. It's, it's the, the, the editing's always good fun for me. I I, I because I because I get to read the book again and, and and get to add in little bits and and flesh out certain parts and maybe cut parts that were a little bit waffly and things and uh, it's it's always it's always good fun and, and and again I'm very very lucky I'm very privileged in that I, I I enjoy writing these characters I enjoy immersing myself in their world um, and any time that I can make that a little bit better I'm going to grab with both hands and that's that's what the editing process is is, is all about yeah. I um I have a friend who's a copy editor, so every once in a while, um I get to hear a little bit of insider complaining, you know, about <laughs> about the process. I mean, from what it sounds like, you're a dream of a writer to work with. But it made me want oh, to ask yes. you, who do you reckon in the whole process? Uh, who do you reckon you gave the most grief to? Like, who's who was back there, like Ooh. complaining about Jonathan Whitelaw? Oh, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> everyone, everyone. They just put up, they just put up a front. It's a lovely front. I, I must admit, it's a lovely front. Uh, but I think they all they all conspire over the uh, over the, the the kettle and their mugs of tea, saying that bloody Jonathan Whitelock's not him again. I, um, <laughs> I I I mentioned in my uh, I mentioned in the acknowledgements for the Bingo Hall detectives that I that I wanted to thank um, Jane, my editor, and, and and Alice who does the PR at, at, uh, at Harper North. I wanted to thank them for constantly uh, answering my emails because I I'm a, I'm a notorious emailer, um, <laughs> and I always have been. Weirdly, I, I I always have been. I don't know if that's a journalism thing. I don't know if it's it, 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 you know I I work as an online journalist, so there's no deadline as such. So I I constantly be emailing or phoning, um, and a uh, I that was in the acknowledgments that I wanted to thank them for constantly being at the other end of an email, and it doesn't mm. matter. I mean, that's the thing. I'll email them about. A, a, any and every little, every sneeze and every cough. I am the <laughs> electronic version of um, of going to the opening of an envelope, as my uh, as my late grandmother used to say. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I the, the, if they are like that, they never they never give me any any sort of hint that that's what they're like, and that's ignorance is bliss, right? <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're enjoying this conversation with Jonathan Whitelaw. We mentioned the Listening Books Members' Choice Award, which this time around was won by Ben Aronovich for his book Amongst Our Weapons, the newest addition to the hugely popular Rivers of London series, narrated by Cobna Holbrook-Smith. If you haven't heard the conversation I had with Cobna, I encourage you to check out that earlier episode of the podcast. More recently, my colleague Emily facilitated a live Q&A with Ben Aronovich, which you can watch back on YouTube. I'll leave a link to it in the show notes. This Q&A was hosted by Royal Voluntary Services Virtual Village Hall, and Listening Books will be doing some more live events with them in the future. So if you'd like to know when the next one is, follow Listening Books on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, which is where they'll be announced. <laughs> You are really involved in the world of crime fiction more widely. I'm, I'm thinking of the the bloody Scotland Crime Writing Festival, for example. Um, I wonder if you can tell us a little about your relationship with the genre, um, especially the cosy crime variety, uh, as both writer and reader. Yeah, um, I guess like every writer, I, I, I'm a voracious reader. Uh, I've been lucky enough, lucky enough in, in a professional capacity as a journalist to to get to review books uh, professionally so that that's been great because it means that I'm never ever stuck really to any one genre for any great amount of time so you know I, I I've always been I, I've always been a big big reader massive reader uh, I always um my mother always tells a story every Christmas without fail uh, about how my p1 teacher uh, said to her get Jonathan to read anything it doesn't really matter he can be reading the Beano um 
you know the Beano comic, and that's the thing. I I always had the caveat that it wasn't it wasn't being it wasn't really being derogatory towards the Beano. It was it was just to prove the point that a uh, that that um you know that that get get kids to read anything. That's something that I do with, with with my own son now as well. And also, I should point out that my mother still gets me the Beano annual every single year. That's why Aww. this conversation comes up. So I've got you know I've got <laughs> nearly thirty of them now, which is which is frightening. Um, but yeah, she, she she still does it, and I still love it. I read it every year, and and, I, and I'm in stitches, and um, been very very lucky to, to to be in a position where I get to do that. I, I get to read all these wonderful authors way ahead of time, which is which is just the sort of cherry on top of the ice and the top of the cake. We, we live in a time we live in a time where cozy crime has has arguably never been more popular. Uh, which is great, which is which is fantastic. I think a lot of it, you know, there's, there's loads and loads of reasons for that. For me, the biggest reason is the escapism of of of, of cozy crime, and it's something that I use the escapism of it of of, of that sort of subgenre of crime is a big big escape for me. Uh, uh, you know, we've all had a, a a really rough couple of years. I've been very fortunate enough to to not have it as rough as a lot of other people, and I'm hugely grateful for that. Um, and I, I don't think it's a coincidence that cozy crime has seen this massive resurgence over the last couple of years that we've had, because it is, by its very, very nature, a total escape from the, the brutality of grounded realism, you know. And yeah. and I, I say that there's still a murder that has to be solved in yeah. the big hall detectives and the vast majority of cozy crime. There's still a killer on the loose, you know, and that that's that's as heinous as it gets. It's just the method that that, that goes about with it. And I, and I'm always fascinated to read other other cozy crime novels. And, and, and other cozy crime novelists and the, the different interpretations that, that, that everybody has of that subgenre because it's just the way that it's packaged it's just the way that the crime's packaged it's just the way that the characters are packaged and yeah. they, and the, the, there's so much there's so much of it about and, and it's great it's, it, it's, it can only be good for the for, for the uh, for the genre to have that that degree of variance and, um, and yeah it's it, it's lovely to see. And you always get jealous, of course. You always get jealous, or I always get jealous, because as I said, everyone's doing such a wonderful job and coming up with these wonderful characters and 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 you know diabolical schemes that always have to get foiled in the end. And <laughs> and it's it's very very nice. It's very nice to be a part of that community and and consider myself a part of that community and 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 just be just just be part of the scene. Who wouldn't want to be part of a scene? Right? <laughs> I've never been part of a scene, so it's 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 nice to finally get there at 36, 37 years old. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what are what are some of the challenges that might be unique to to the cozy crime genre? The the first one that what I always say about cozy crime is that you never see the knife go in. Ah, you as a crime writer, you find that you have to dial it back sometimes. Not all the time. Not all the time. Uh, you know, traditionally, cozy crime doesn't have any graphic sex or violence in in it. And when you're writing a murder scene or you're writing a, a, a scene about a killer, that those are those are the best bits, right? <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the best bit of, of, of crime fiction as a as a as a whole. So it means that what what you tend to find is that there's a greater emphasis on things like character and setting, and a, you know maybe more humour. It's not to say that you don't mm. get bags and bags of humour in things like police procedurals and things like that, but there there isn't there isn't maybe as much of an emphasis on say the investigation. It's really really fascinating o- over here in Canada. I teach a I teach a, some creative writing workshops, and one of the ones that I do is on crime fiction just in in general. And I always say that to the class. Um, you know, you, ne- you never see the knife go in. You never get any sort of graphic detail, uh, you know, a blow-by-blow account of the of the, the actual murder itself. Mm-hmm. Or if you do, then it tends to be a lot more sort of rounded edges as opposed to, you know, going into, going into forensic details to how things happened and indeed the investigations. You mostly find that your, your detectives in cosy crimes aren't police officers or law enforcement or anything like that. So Jason and Amateur are a, are a perfect example of that. He's a journalist. She's retired. Um, and so the challenge tends to be motivation for them, mm-hmm. because if you've got a murder and a cop turns up, the cops they are doing their job. That's that's their that's their, their bread and butter. That's what they do. Whereas with a uh, out of work journalist and a seventy year old pillar of the community, what's their motivation to to, to investigate the murder? And in, in this case, for the Bingham Hall detectives, it's a friend of Amethyst. The village hall vendetta, without going into too many details, it's a it's a little bit different. 
but that's good fun. That's that's the challenge. I always like to challenge myself as a writer. Um, it's really really nice to spend time and as I've mentioned to be to be in that world of of Jason and Amazon and and, and Penrith and the Lake District, which is a wonderful part of the world. As you say, it's a beautiful part of the world, and I've 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 been there once, so I'm not like I'm not overly familiar with it personally. But I was just wondering um, what the setting of the of the Lake District offered you for the story. It's a uh, it's a place that's very very dear to to, to me and my family first and foremost. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we spent spent a lot of time there. I spent a lot of time there over the course of my life, younger life, adult life, and it is beautiful. It is a beautiful part of the world. Um, what what I always say is with Cumbria in particular and Penrith, um, having grown up in Scotland and 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 lived and worked in Scotland for for such a long time, if I was ever heading down to you know Manchester or you know my 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 dad and stepmom they live in Liverpool or London for for work or what have you. The train line always goes through Penrith Station, and the thing from Penrith Station is that you can see the ruins of Penrith Castle mm. from the like the other side of the car park, and it's it's it it, it 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 was always this wonderful fascination that this train station that you blink and miss on your way to somewhere else is this sort of gateway to what is some of the most beautiful scenery and one of the, the one of the loveliest parts of of the UK, and as I say, the the, the world, and I think that was sort of playing into my playing into my imagination when I was trying to come up with, you know, where Jason and Amata were from, where they were going to be going about and doing their business and, and their investigations and things. And I think um, really, actually, now in hindsight, it could only ever really be Cumbria and the Lake District and Oswater and, and Penrith and all these wonderful places. Mm. Because I think, again, it just felt so natural. To, 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 these characters had come, had, had come to me so, so fully formed straight out of my imagination. And then when I thought about that area and thought about it as a place and, and I guess, you know, in a, in a sort of roundabout sort of way that, that the series is my ode to that area and the sort of happy memories that, I, that I've got of it. There's no, finer, there's no finer way of paying tribute to happy memories by setting a whole load of murders there. That's, that's, the, <laughs> that's the, ca- the caveat of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a crime writer. I think with the, the cosy setting, um, you know, there's a lot of countryside there and there's a lot of rolly fields and there's a lot of distance between tiny villages and bigger towns and, and, and cities, obviously. And it gives you a little bit more scope to have um, that maybe claustrophobic element to it, that, that claustrophobic mm-hmm. environment of, of maybe isolation. And the, thing, the weird thing is, like in real life, you know, you go to Penrith, you don't feel isolated at all. You go to Allswater and see this massive, this massive vista of, of all the lakes and things like that, and you know, you don't feel you don't feel isolated in, in, in the slightest, in, in any sort of negative way. If anything, actually, it's really really nice because you can get away from you can get away from it all. But of course, like like anything else, as a crime writer, you make everything sinister, and <laughs> uh, and that and that's it. So that so the, there is the, there's that sort of small town mentality of of everybody knowing each other, which which really really worked for the in, in the context of of sort of busy busy nature of of Amita and 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 our. And our a fellow bingo club uh, members so yeah it, it just it, it ticked a lot of boxes for me and 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 as i say it's it's my it's my own ode and my own tribute to a place that's that means a great deal to me that's lovely we'll be um sharing a clip of that on twitter and 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 tagging the lake district tourism <laughs> <laughs> I can assure you that there are five minutes in the post. No, I'm only kidding. I'm, uh, I'm only kidding. I promise. Yeah. Um, because there's a lovely championing of local journalism in the novel, um, and and of course you've worked as a journalist yourself. I wondered if you'd like to say anything about why you know why it's important. Yeah, it's. I, I mean, as, as as much as I've said that the the. That the book's a tribute to the Lake District and Cumbria. Um, my own tribute to it. It is a tribute to journalism and local journalism in particular. You know, I was a local journalist. Um, it's a very, very important part of the the process of becoming a journalist, becoming a reporter. Is the local element of it. You know, it's so fondly thought of uh, all around the world. Really, it's not. It's not just a not just in the UK. Um, or Scotland, where I worked, it's it's so fondly thought of, and local papers. A, for the longest time, bucked the trend of um, you know downward circulation figures and things like that, mostly because they were as much embedded in the in the community as anything else. Mm. And 
I always see local journalism as playing two sort of very, very important roles within the wider context of of, of, of culture, of society. First and foremost, as, I, as I've said, it, they were a wonderful voice and champion of the local area. And uh, that was anything, you know, the, the, the classic one, and there's obviously references to it in the Bingo Hall Detectives, it's not just giant marrow competitions and, and, and you know, <laughs> first date school pictures and things like that. But yeah. local court stories are, are covered as well that sometimes have national interest and things. So they, 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 they've always been that wonderful, uh, that wonderful voice of, of the local community that they, that they serve and serve loyally and indeed are loyally served by the community. Um, and it's a wonderful sort of symbiosis that, that exists with them. And the second, the second part of it, the sort of second pillar of it is the, the important role that they play for the industry of journalism. You learn so much at a local paper and it tends to be the, the sort of well-trodden path that when you qualify as a journalist and you get your journal or you start being a journalist that you go through the local element of it then towards a sort of you know semi-national and then maybe a national then an international potentially a uh, media organization and a lot of the skills that you learn on the ground doing the job at a local level will always be transferable to, to a national and over the years a uh, when i worked at, at national level you would see you could always tell the new reporters that came in who hadn't come from that that local background they always had so much more to learn because the local paper will have you doing so much more. As I say, one moment you might be covering some terrible incident that's happening in the town, the next you're, you're doing the, the local giant marrow competition. And that sort of change of pace, you learn so much as a reporter and you learn so much as a writer doing that sort of thing. And I think obviously having, having uh, Jason be out of work at the start of the Bingo Hall Detectives because he's become a victim, as so many colleagues, as so many people that I know and have known throughout my career, uh, being a victim of the of of the age um, was important for me. It was important for me to acknowledge that. I think, mm. um, and again, in, in my very very small way, hopefully that I've put across that that tribute and that adoration that I have for local journalism as well. Yeah, I I love journalism. I I, I love being a journalist or or, or being a or, or loved being a journalist. Uh, it's an important role, um, no matter what. His public perception is. Uh, I've only ever known good journalists. That's the that, that's the thing about it. I yeah. also think J Jason's probably a better journalist than I uh, ever was. <laughs> but it wouldn't be hard. It wouldn't be hard. <laughs> now you've mentioned your forthcoming book, uh, the Village Hall Vendetta. That's coming out in. Is it May that it's coming out? May yes, May eleventh. Yep, May eleventh. It's yeah. coming out. Yep. Wonderful. Would you like to say a little a little bit about that? Absolutely. Yeah, it's a uh, so Jason and Amateur are back, uh, up to their usual tricks, up to their up to their old tricks. Um they are hot on the heels of uh the murder of a local philanthropist, local businessman, who has bought this a uh, mysterious painting that is sort of part of part of the, the, the national consciousness and it was painted by a um by a, a, a local Cumbrian a uh, artist in the 70s and the, the, the rumour is that the painting's cursed Ooh. and uh, the, the, latest, the latest owner of it is murdered and the curse has struck once more <gasps> uh, or has it you're just going to have to read and find out. That's that's the thing. It's uh, yeah. It's um, there's a wonderful tagline to it. There's a, there's a wonderful tagline to it that the that, that Jen, my editor, came up with. Uh, it's it, so it's the village of Vendetta. There's a fine art to murder, and that, oh, I mean nice. that, that's the thing that got me excited. And I'd written the thing. I, I know how it ends, and that got me really really excited. So I, I thought again. I thought we were on to we were on to a winner with that. I've joked. I've joked since the Bingo Hall Detectives came out that um, all the best parts. Uh, all the best parts of the, of the series, uh, the editorial team have come up with, and, and all the rubbish parts. That's my fault, you know. So things like what, one of the, one of the things that people have, have said to me constantly since I've been called detectives, they've said two things that I've been that I've been absolutely uh, delighted with. One is the chapter titles in uh, of the Bingo Hall Detectives, which are all named after bingo calls. Oh, um, yeah. And also with the with the paperback edition, the page numbers are little bingo balls. Oh. And the amount of people that have come up to me to Amazing. say 
that they that they love those little little parts of it, and I always say to them, I didn't come up with any of that. That was that was entirely <laughs> the idea of the editorial team. So I, I, yeah, I, I very very honestly say, yeah. <laughs> exactly, I very honestly say that all the good bits about the book that uh, I didn't do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's coming out in May. So while they're waiting, um, can you recommend any other cozy crime books? Absolutely. Um, one one series that I can't recommend enough is a uh, is GM Hall Jonathan Hall a uh, his a spoonful of murder that's the first in the series um, and that's wonderful that's that's simply wonderful he's he's a he's an absolutely fantastic writer uh, and a lovely bloke uh, a big big Doctor Who fan like myself another another Jonathan and a big big Doctor Who fan like myself which is which is always <laughs> nice to nice to hear and see so we've uh, I've been very very lucky enough to sort of bond with him quite a bit over. Um, classic Doctor Who, and and we have arguments, and we have fights, and we have we have nice chats as well about about things like that. But he's he's a he's a a, 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 a fantastic writer. Um, Robert Thurgood's a uh, Marlow Murder Club, obviously, is another one as well. Uh, there's a second one. In fact, I recently reviewed the second one. Death comes to Marlow. Uh, would would highly recommend would highly recommend that. Yeah, he he won last year's Members' Choice Award. Of course, actually. absolutely, yeah, I, I, yeah. absolutely that. I mean, you know, there's the, the S. J. Bennett's um, Royal series as well, where where the Queen is the is the uh, is is the is the the the, the detective. Um, but that's the great thing about cozy crime. What one of the big big things that I love about it is when you start a new series or you start a new book and you find out what you know who's the detective in this who's it going to be now who's it going to be next and it feels to me it feels to me like it's really been that proper shot in the arm for the mm. crime genre that the, the, this sort of research is because you're getting so many of these wonderful you know wonderful quirky off the cuff completely unconventional detectives um sg bennett's a prime example of that you know who would have thought that you would have queen elizabeth ii as the detective you know, it's 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 yeah. terrific. It, it's such a wonderful <laughs> concept. The concept sells it immediately. It's it's wonderful, and she's a lovely lady. I was I was lucky enough to be on to be on a panel with her at Bloody Scotland last year. And it's not a listen. It's not. I'm not doing a disservice to the police procedural that, that tends to be a police officer. But it's one of the motivations that I've always had, and one of the motivations that I did cozy crime or write cozy crime is that. I knew that there was that there was nothing that I could add original or, or creatively original to the, to the police procedural trope of a, a another detective, mm. and so I decided to sort of cut my losses and go right. Well, what I can do is maybe do something a little bit different, approach it from a completely different angle, and and that. Well, thankfully, cozy crime offers you a platform to do something like that with the humour, with the with the different kind of detective, all these sorts of things. You know, if you if you haven't given cozy crime a go, then I would always highly recommend it. It's a, a bit different. It's total escapism, and it's good fun as well. It's it, it's really really good fun. I have an absolute ball when I when I sit down and read a cozy crime novel, and and I do as well when I'm writing. I'm I'm lucky enough to do that. So it's 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 always it's always a good laugh, and we all need a laugh, right? There isn't enough laughter in this world. <laughs> exactly, Jonathan. Thank you so much for your recommendations and for getting up way before dawn, <laughs> way before any reasonable person would want to be up Not at uh, all. to do this with Not me. At Thank all. you so A much. Pleasure. Thank you for joining me for this conversation with Jonathan Whitelaw. You can find the Bingo Hall Detectives in our collection at Listening Books or in your favourite bookstore. And keep an eye out for the Village Hall Vendetta out in May. The Listening Books podcast is produced by Listening Books a UK charity that provides an audiobook lending service for over 115,000 members who find that an illness, disability, learning difficulty, or mental health condition affects their ability to read the printed word or hold a book. It's simple to join. For more information, head to our website, www.listening-books.org.uk. 